for the invitation to speak there. I'm in a good audience today. Uh, the goal of today is to familiarize you with the native species that are growing around you um, here in northern Loudoun uh, and how the natural plant communities have, have changed over, over time. Um, also touch on the importance of uh, native plants to the ecosystem and also the, the threats to native plants. Uh, and wrap up giving you a few... Uh, references for where you can go to, to learn more about uh, native species. Uh, just a little bit more about uh, move from the west coast to the east coast in 1980 to Boston where I got a, a PhD in organic chemistry and after 20 years in, in the uh, chemistry business I decided it was time to revert to uh, go over to plan B. I'd always been interested in plants and nature um, so uh, I hooked up with the uh, New England Wildflower Society, where I became a plant conservation volunteer, where I learned about ecosystems and identification of, of plants. Um, to sort of commercialize that interest, uh, I decided I'd like to try and interact more with the public and introduce native plants to people's landscapes. So I um, got a job as a landscape gardener. Uh, also, Mount Auburn Cemetery, which is actually a, quite a large arboreum in the uh, Boston area. Uh, I was a plant curatorial assistant, which is uh, I basically mapped plants, identified plants that were in, in the uh, environment. And I also got an appreciation for how plants grew uh, together. Uh, just to make that formal, I went on to get a uh, certificate in landscape design uh, from uh, Harvard University. Uh, again, to formalize the training so I could actually design uh, landscapes for people mm -hmm. using native mm -hmm. plants. Uh, I had my own business in the Boston area from 2009 till 2012 uh, when we uh, moved down to this area. And now we have three acres of woodland where I spend time nurturing the native plants there, pulling out the invasives and blogging about the experience. So native plants. Oops. Yeah. What, why are you interested, in, or why am I? Why are people interested in native plants? So uh, there are a link between uh, the land and the people. It's genius, genius loci is, is a term for it, the spirit of the place. Um, and native plants are ecologically important. They basically are the tie between the solar energy hitting the earth, converting that energy into food that animals eat and we eat the animals and whatnot. So if without plants, you would have no conversion of solar energy to, to food energy. Um, and just when we talk about a native plant, it's indistinguished to a non-native plant. Uh, generally consider them as, as plants that have existed in an area prior to 1492 with the uh, European um, explorers arriving and bringing uh, new materials into the uh, area. Sorry. Uh, when, to talk about plants being native to the United States or native to Virginia or native to Loudoun County. A lot of those are, are based on political boundaries, but a plant doesn't necessarily know this is the border and I only belong here and not over there. Uh, a better way to uh, consider that is our eco regions. Basically, they're areas with the same, similar soil chemistry, similar climate, and they're connected together. So imagine it's a place where where plants could freely migrate north and south, east, west, uh, and, and still have the same environment. Uh, for Virginia, has uh, five ecosystems from the coastal plain and the tidewater region, the Piedmont and the Blue Ridge, where we're located, uh, the Valley and Ridge, just on the other side, just west of our Blue Ridge Mountains here, and the Appalachian Plateau. 
Um, in contrast to native plants, uh, referred to plants not from here as exotic species. Uh, exotic species are often uh, naturalized, that is, they survive in the wild without any assistance from, from people. Uh, a lot of, well, a number of exotic species are, are considered as being invasive plants. That's, they are able to outcompete uh, the natives for uh, resources. They put out leaves earlier in the spring, keep them on later in the fall, so they shade out the ground. Uh, they're not consumed by the uh, animals and insects to the same degree the native plants are, so that gives the invasives a leg up and, and causes damage to the native population. Uh, not all exotics are, are invasive species, however. Uh, I have a Dutch white clover here. Uh, which a lot of people consider is pretty beneficial. It adds nitrogen in the soil. You see it, but it is uh, considered a native plant. In, uh, sorry, an invasive species in West Virginia and Tennessee, and several other states. Again, it depends where you are on just how invasive a species is. Um, this little map I've hi highlighted Loudoun County um, to show basically where our eco regions are. And, and there's some initial uh, additional breakdown of the physiographic regions, which have more to do with the subsoil um, that exists. But the, the brownish tones there are, um, oops, let me do this. So all these brown colored areas, that's considered the Piedmont area. It's a lower, uh, smoother topography, deeper soils. Um, and the green areas are, are extensions of the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains, uh, higher elevations, thinner soils in general. Uh, soil quality and um, in the Piedmont is actually, it's variable. Uh, some places are quite fertile, others are, are not particularly. Uh, fertile. There is one little spot here, which is a continuation from, from Maryland here. It's the uh, limestone lowlands, uh, and that's really quite uh, good quality uh, farmland there. It's, it has a lot of calcium in the soil. Um, sure. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, another exceptional feature here is that the the Blue Ridge, generally being a ridge with high soil and a lot of rocks in it, tends to be acidic. And uh, the northern Blue Ridge, it's in our area, there are actually a lot of calcium formations, which make the soil much richer, which adds to the uh, diversity of, of uh, plant life there. So this is, we're fortunate to live in an area with a lot of different types of, uh, of plants able to grow. Looking a little bit at, at uh, land use land use history prior to uh, colonization, uh, vascular plants were first um, evolved about 420 million years ago. Uh, in intervening time, there have been a lot of changes in the climate. Uh, plants have moved around; they've evolved. Um, But uh, where we have the best understanding is, is since the last glaciation, which was about uh, 1,200 years ago. At that time, the area here, the Piedmont and, and Blue Ridge, was covered with boreal forests, which are most red pines, uh, jack pines, a lot of spruce trees that uh, you don't find in this area anymore. Um, as the climate warmed, the uh, species from further south that were adapted to warmer weather moved northwards as the, as the spruce and some of the pines moved, uh, moved out of the area. Uh, as long as people have been in 
uh, around. There have been, uh, they've been playing around with the environment. Uh, some of the earliest estimates are that uh, about 17,000 years ago were the first evidence of, of humans uh, in this area. But uh, people, again, have been modifying the, the land for their own purposes, mainly by use of fire to clear land uh, or the understory to improve hunting. Um, I guess security also was an issue by clearing out the land. You have a better uh, view of the area around you and you could be safer from, from predators. Um, also loss of megafauna was uh, something I hadn't appreciated before. There used to be uh, giant animals that would eat up shrubbery and whatnot as those disappeared about 10,000 years ago. There's less consumption of that layer of plants and the forests tended to get thicker. Uh, that uh, indirectly led to uh, more intense fires as it, that burnt through the uh, understory of the woods. Um, so as a result of the, uh, actually uh, of humans and their use of fire, the, the composition of the forest oh, it was skewed towards a, a oak hickory mix. And those species are uh, more resistant to fire uh, compared to like uh, tulip trees and, and maples and the like. So, so a little bit about how forest cover has changed um, after colonization began. Uh, during the 1600s, there's actually an increase in forest cover in this area. Uh, there's a this is a result of a actual drop of the indigenous people's population due to disease. Um, so in fewer, fewer humans, more forest cover was able to develop. Uh, here we go. Through the uh, 1700s, there was a decrease in forest as colonization increased and uh, there's more conversion of the land to, to farmland, clearing of the land. Um, this was moderated somewhat since the land wasn't all that fertile. A uh, uh, farm wouldn't last all that long, so it would be abandoned and allowed to go back to, to, uh, to forest cover. Um, 1800s through the 1920s uh, saw a huge increase in logging um, for uh, construction, um, for, um, I guess there, there's a increase in the um, iron industry. So wood was used to make charcoal to, to, uh, to uh, convert iron ore into, into iron. Um, what else? There's also uh, the um, Civil War was a, was a big draw on the uh, forest as wood was consumed for, for the war effort. And a general uh, belief that there's plenty of forest around, we don't have to conserve, conserve it. So uh, again, that really brought us to the point of, um, by some estimates, every part of Virginia had no forest at some point. Uh, during the time, except for like the various highest peaks that were inaccessible. Um, this kind of changed around the 1920s for several reasons. Uh, World War I uh, pulled people out of the farms and they returned. When they returned, they were more likely to go to the cities, so farms were closed down there. The Great Depression also uh, so a lot of farms going bankrupt, um, fire suppression and forest con uh, conservation efforts were also starting to catch hold. Uh, so uh, the new forests that were, were growing up weren't identical to the ones that were there previously. Uh, again, as you are no longer, as you're suppressing fires, you're not encouraging the oak species, oak hickory species as much and, and seeing more uh, maple trees. Um, and, and beach, the, the fire sensitive trees coming in. Um, also contributing to change the, in the mix of species was uh, loss due to uh, disease. 
um, the chestnut blight in uh, 1904 basically wiped out the chestnut population. Um, there's only a few left. Dutch elm disease was uh, 1930, uh, which came in on, from imported wood and wiping out most of the American elm trees. Um, we're still seeing the effect of uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid, especially in the um, um, Blue Ridge area has decimated uh, that population of trees. And a uh, recent example is the emerald ash borer, which came into the Midwest and is basically spread through and wiped out almost all the uh, ash trees in this area. So we're seeing uh, other pressures on the forest there. Um, currently there's an increase in Virginia, an increase in the volume of trees available, not necessarily the acreage. So there's a lot of forests are getting denser. Uh, there's a lot of um, tree plantations around that which count towards the population of trees there, but they're commercial and, and uh, are basically being harvested as a crop. Um, go a little bit into the forest type that we encounter here. Uh, pine oak forests are, are the ones that you'll see at the, um, mostly at the tops of the Blue Ridge area and the higher peaks. Uh, here the soil is thin, more acidic. Um, the main species here are white and pitch pines and chestnut and white oaks. Uh, this photo was taken from uh, Weverton, uh, Weverton Cliffs, just across the river in Maryland towards, uh, let's see that Loudon Heights over here. And this is what, Short Mountain? Is that, I forgot the name. Short Hill Mountain, there you go, over here. Um, the particular trees here are, are not super common. Um, they are uh, more prevalent in this area. These are table mountain pines. They have shorter needles than white pines. Um, quite a, a striking tree, but you only find them growing up in this uh, rocky environment where the soil is acidic. You go down the hill, probably, uh, two or 300 feet in elevation, they don't exist there anymore. Uh, the prevalent forest type uh, in this area is the uh, dry mesic oak hickory forest. Um, the term mesic refers to not too wet, not too dry, it's a kind of just right amount of moisture in the soil. Uh, here, red, white, black, Scarlet oaks dominate along with several species of hickory. Um, and this used to be where you would find a lot of, of the American chestnut uh, prior to their, their demise. Uh, younger forests will have um, more uh, fire sensitive trees in them, like maples and uh, tulip trees. Uh, one as I mentioned before, that the soil types in, in this area are variable. There are places with acidic soils and places with uh, very rich, calcium-rich soils. One way to have an idea of what those are is through uh, indicator species. Uh, red bud trees and Virginia bluebells are indicators of, of rich soil. So if you see a patch with a lot of red buds, you know that soil is a little bit different than places that they lack the red buds. Um, blueberries, uh, azaleas, mountain laurels are acid loving plants and you'll find those at the higher elevations or places with particularly acidic soils. Um, another forest park, not a lot of it here, but along the uh, Potomac or some of the larger streams are the river floodplain forests. Uh, these experience a lot of disturbance from water coming through and so there's a high risk of, of invasive species coming in uh, there. Uh, native trees that you'll find there are the silver maples, the river birch, sycamores, and uh, well, box elders are just about everywhere, but uh, that is one of the places you'll find them. These lighter colored trees here, this is the 
uh, floodplain area of the forest. I think these are probably mostly silver maples, which have that kind of grayish green <laughs> up here as in the dry oak forest. You see definitely a different, different type of tree, uh, more browns here in the fall. Disruption caused by flooding or caused by clearing uh, ground leads to uh, sort of sets the stage for new plants to grow. There's a process called succession, which is uh, some people consider it a theory. I, I think it, it does work out pretty well in practice where bare, bare ground proceeds to a, a succession of uh, going from bare ground to grasslands, then after those are established and shrubs start growing up and the shrubs then lead to a woodlands, which then get denser and turn into forest. Um, some of the uh, early successional plants that you'll, you'll find are, um, are plants that love the sun and reproduce very quickly. Um, some of the shrubs that come in early are like blackberries and elderberries, junipers and sumacs. Um, the trees in the early succession, black cherry and black locust, white pine are, are some of the, the native trees that you'll find in here. Um, thought I could pick out where some of the junipers were. It's kind of a... <laughs> mix of plants there. Um, again, as the woodlands then go to more shade tolerant plants like the oaks and the hickories. Um, but also in the succession process, it creates openings for invasive species, if, which are again, aggressive growers. If there's an opportunity for, for uh, an invasive to grow, this is a, a good place because there's lots of openings. Um, one of the results of, of succession are the Rodero forests, which uh, Rodero refers to a, a waste place. Uh, it's kind of rude, but uh, it's, it's a term that's used. Um, Rodero forests are mostly built on uh, former agricultural sites. Um, they're a mixture of native and exotic species and again as a result of su succession many of them are invasive um the uh, primary trees there are red cedar and white pine tulip trees maple box elder um and you'll also find some invasives like the tree of heaven a lot of japanese shrub honeysuckles uh and autumn all over a couple of the um uh, the shrubs that, that are very common in those forests. So, let's see. Let's go a little bit into ethnobotany or how people uh, use the plants in the area. This is a map from uh, John Smith in 1624, uh, basically showing Virginia. I put a little circle here around where Loudoun County is. Uh, did this digitally, so I didn't <laughs> face the map. But um, the area up here was primarily peopled by the Manahonic tribes. Um, whereas down in this area was the, the Powhatan Confederation, uh, the people that built. I think we have, know, have the most history about. Um, so the Van Hoaks were um, primarily hunter-gatherers. They were a uh, Siouan-speaking tribe. Uh, again, they uh, uh, occupied the area from Rappahannock to up to the Loudoun counties. There's a pretty low uh, population density, about 3,000 people there, estimated in, in uh, 1600. Uh, most of their established settlements were down along the Rappahannock, so they were coming up to this area mostly for hunting and, and gathering food. Um, 
they didn't really get along well with the the Powhatan Confederacy who spoke a different language and, and really had a different culture with more established uh, agricultural practices and, and settlements. Um, according to Thomas Jefferson, the, the um, Powhatans were, were growing squash and potatoes and, and tobacco um, early on. Um, among the foods that the uh, hunter gatherers um, had available to them uh, were uh, tree nuts or uh, butternut, walnut, hickories. Uh, here I have a picture of a butternut tree. Uh, it's similar to a, wall, uh, uh, a black walnut, but the bark is a little bit lighter in color and the leaf shape. Um, is is different. There's a um, basically the compound leaf has a terminal leaf leaflet on it, whereas a black walnut has no terminal leaflet. So you could tell them about that. Also, the nuts are different. The butter nuts are more uh, oval, whereas a black walnut is, is circular. Um, tree fruit, where uh, also available, most of them were, were very small. Uh, the exception is the pawpaw tree, which is the largest uh, fruit, tree fruit native to North America. It's the only member of the tropical soursop family that lives in a temperate cl climate. There's evidence that uh, pawpaws uh, date back to uh, to the Miocene period, that's 23, five to 23 million years ago, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, basically what is now the continental United States. And they were likely spread by megafauna, like giant sloths that would eat them and drop them and spread them around the, the continent. Uh, the name Papa came from uh, the Spanish uh, explorers who thought it looked like a papaya. Um, the genus name for Papa. Asimania is uh, taken from the Powhatan word for uh, wheat plum. Um, also special about the Popeye is that it's the only host for the zebra swallowtail butterfly. So it's, uh, we're fortunate we have a lot of Popeye trees around our, our property and, and almost all our butterflies are zebras. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's say that it was the largest tree fruit and, uh, after that. That is from the soursop family, so the tropical. They're uh, caramoyas. I, I don't know, not really familiar with a lot of them, um, but things that you might get if you are in Mexico and whatnot. That, some of their uh, fruits are are in the family. They tend to be, well, there's, there's also a sweet sop, so they're not all sour, um, but similar in structure to a, to a papa with a soft fruit and, and large seeds to them. Um, comment about the, uh, uh, red mulberry was uh, pretty common. Unfortunately, that's uh, interbred with the white mulberry that was brought in uh, early in the uh, 1900s to try and stimulate a, a silk industry. Uh, but those trees escaped and have, have since interbred with the red mulberry. So uh, while your tree may have red berries on it instead of white, it could it's not necessarily one of the natives. Um, black cherry, don't really think of getting much food value out of that, but that uh, was a component in uh, pemmican, which is a high energy uh, food that made, made by the uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, it's, it's way up high, yeah, I've got several trees. I, I see them on some of the neighbor's properties as I'm driving by. They're very small black berries, hackberry, also sugar berry is another name for it. 
A probably, I think they're still visible after the leaves fall off because that's, that's when I notice them. So they'd be a late, uh, late summer ripening fruit. Birds eat them. There's so many hackberries around. It's, yeah. Trees is a uh, persimmon. Uh, it's an early successional tree. The fruits here are ripen in the fall. Up until that point, they're extremely astringent. Um, and they're not really edible until they, they get mushy or even to the point that they're uh, the skin's falling off of them. Um, there is a distinction that trees that are native to the north, this area, the fruits do ripen earlier. If you got a tree that came from uh, further south, it really requires a much more cold weather for the fruit to, to ripen. So uh, you don't have to necessarily wait for a hard frost. It depends on, on the genetics of your tree. Uh, deer and other wildlife really like uh, okay, deer, deer, and other wildlife really like uh, persimmons, uh, so it's very hard to find them sitting on the ground. Uh, you really need to pull them off the tree if you want to get some. Uh, there are a lot of berries available. Um, Dewberry is one of the first uh, uh, berries to, to ripen, to, to bloom in the, uh, in the spring. It grows on very lax stems that really trail along the ground. Um, after the blue, uh, dewberries, uh, black raspberries will, will start to go into bloom. Um, and then that's followed up by the wild blackberries uh, more towards the end of, uh, end of June, they get ripe. Um, there are two types of blueberries. Uh, in general, there are low bush blueberries, which are found on acidic soils higher up. They grow in shady areas, uh, whereas the high bush blueberries, the ones that have the nicer fruit that you're more likely to find in the store, are prefer moist areas in uh, full sun. Uh, also, I have a little picture here of the uh, wild strawberry. Um, it blooms in early spring with little white flowers. Uh, the, um, the leaves have a whitish color underneath. So if you see something with three leaves and you flip the leaf over and it kind of looks white, uh, that's likely to be a, a native blueberry. There's a Thank you. Strawberry. Um, there is a mock strawberry or Indian strawberry that's a, a weed that looks very similar, but it has yellow flowers when it blooms. And the underside of the leaf is more of a dull green. It doesn't have that white appearance to it. So you can tell them apart. Um, in, into greens, uh, many things can be a uh, consumed as, as either a, a cooked green or a, a fresh green. Pokeweed um, is really only palatable when it first comes out of the ground as a shoot and it needs to be cooked. Uh, otherwise, uh, all parts of the plant are, are poisonous. Um, wood sorrel, here there's some yellow wood sorrel, which you see all over is the weed. Uh, there are uh, non-native exotic wood sorrels, but there's also native ones. Uh, you can tell the native one, if you look at this seed five here, how it goes up at a 90 degree angle, that's indicative of the, of the native ones. If, if the seed kind of goes straight up from the stem, uh, or it, if it doesn't have this angle to it, it's, it's more likely to be uh, one of European origin. Um, Chickweed is another thing, probably most of the chickweed you run into is going to be uh, of a non-native variety, but there are several native ones. This is a star chickweed. It has a fairly large, well-defined white flower on it, and the leaves go down and meet right at the stem. It's not a, not a petiole or a 
stem leaf on it. So uh, that's one way of, of recognizing the, the native chickweed. Um, violets are, uh, let's see. Actually, I'll go more into violets later, so move on. Uh, medicinal plants. Um, many of these are used as uh, teas or, or as um, as a topical treatments for a wide variety of ailments. Uh, shown here uh, is uh, spice bush in bloom in the springtime. It's very indicative. You can find it in, mostly in moist areas, although it will grow in full sun uh, in drier areas. But where it really likes to live is is in a, a damp woods. Um, the bark has a spicy aromatic scent to it and the berries which ripen in late summer are um, have a um, allspice type flavor and they were used to spice food the berries are also hot very high in fat so birds really like uh, the spice bush berries especially as they're getting ready for migration um practices that as the uh, Europeans came in, uh, as with the colonists, they a lot of them brought their own food. They knew the food, they knew how to cook it, they knew how to grow it, uh, as opposed to what was growing here uh, naturally. Uh, but that food also had a much higher nutritional density than most of the Native American uh, plants. Per acre, you could get more food value. So it really made sense to grow those. Uh, wheat, rye, barley, oats, was just a list of, of things that were being grown in Virginia. It's according to Thomas Jefferson, who wrote a book, The State of Virginia, I believe, which is huge. Basically, has every statistic about Virginia at the time was written in. Uh, 1820 or so. Um, they also brought, the Europeans also brought other New World crops from South America, like tomatoes and peppers and whatnot up to this area. Um, again, for the first colonists, land was plentiful, so it really encouraged wasteful practices uh, in land management. Again, the soils tended to be acidic air and low in fertility, so a farm may only last, be really productive for uh, two or three years before it was time to basically abandon it and and, uh, and clear some new space to it. Unique to Loudoun uh, was uh, John Binns, who developed and championed what was known as the Loudoun method. Uh, and he's a native to, uh, to Loudoun County. and um, he was uh, very uh, dissatisfied with the productivity of the soil. And uh, he uh, learned about practices of adding gypsum to the, to the soil, which uh, increases the calcium, the richness of the soil, as well as improving the, the texture of the soil and planting clover to increase nitrogen levels in the soil. Um, he was able to substantially increase the, the the productivity of his land. Um, some other practices such as deep plowing, uh, crop rotation, and use of manure uh, were incorporated. And uh, in 1803, he published a, a booklet called The Loudon Method, which documented all this. And uh, a number of people were interested. Thomas Jefferson uh, um, made note of it as a, really a good way to farm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, while well, this cut, these ideas cut, uh, uh, had traction in Northern Virginia, the farmers further south uh, didn't really like the idea. They didn't want to change the way they did their farming. So, you know, they kind of stayed more, mostly as the Loudon method and didn't go you know, too much further. Um, along with food crops, the, the colonists brought over seeds for their cattle, which they knew their cattle would would be would be palatable as opposed to again, unknown grasses, whatnot. Uh, this is just a list of some of the uh, native 
grasses that can be used as forage and uh, and then some of the introduced species kind of rated from cool season grasses, grasses that come up um, March, April when they sprout versus warm season grasses, which uh, more May time frame that they start to grow and mature. Um, cool season grasses will put out seeds probably about the end of June versus uh, July and August for warm season grasses. There are our hundred grass and grass like plants that are are in the mid Atlantic. Um, the uh, Virginia uh, Department of Conservation and Rec Recreation has a a pamphlet on on grasses that you could use native grasses for restoration and landscaping. You can find that online. Um, just a few of the grasses. Um, Native grasses here. Purple top is a cool season grass. Um, it gets its name from the purplish tops, the, the seeds that form. Um, we have a, a, a farmer that, that crops that nearby. He gets two to three crops of, of hay off of that each year. A little blue stem. It's a grass that uh, grows warm season grass and it, it does quite well on poor soils. Uh, it does have bluish stems uh, in the uh, during the growing season, but where it really stands out is in the fall when it turns this bright orange and then it has these white seeds on the stem that catch the light. So they can really stand out, especially if the if the sun is going down behind it. Indian grass is another species uh, of with high forage value. It does have kind of bluish green stems and in uh, uh, July, uh, August timeframe, it puts up these uh, seed heads with their um, tall plumes. Um, one grass you can find growing well in the area is uh, bottle brush grass in here. Um, the cool season grass uh, likes rich woods. I've actually seen patches of this growing in what appeared to be uh, full, uh, under full leaf coverage. So it gets just a little bit of light and it has these distinctive bottle brush, brush like uh, seed heads on it. Uh, river oats is uh, another grass. It does sprout early, but it, it goes, the seeds develop later in the year. Uh, it has very um, tough roots. It's uh, growing in, in moist locations along uh, rivers. Uh, so these roots are able to keep the grass uh, holding in place. And it is, uh, does have some uh, forage value as well. For... So talk about some uh, smaller plants here, the spring ephemerals. These are plants that grow in woodland areas under uh, deciduous trees. They sprout when early in the spring when there are no leaves out. So there's plenty of sun on the ground. Uh, they grow, they put out flowers and, and go to seed and complete that whole cycle before the trees uh, leaf out and basically take away all the, all the sunlight. Uh, Virginia bluebells are uh, excellent example of the type of plant. Uh, quite striking, you can see a large patch again, mostly in moist areas. Uh, here we see some spring beauties, which are the little pink flowers here, and Dutchman's bridges, the white ones here, that both look like pantaloons being held up a, uh, on a clothesline. Um, these grow in drier locations. Both these, uh, all three of these species, are indicators of, of rich soil. So if you have rich soil, there's a chance you have this. Uh, May apples are another plant that will basically carpet the forest floor um, until probably about the end of June or so where it gets too shady and they die off. And this area will be basically bare ground um, in a couple of months after this picture is taken. Um, ferns. Lots of 
ferns around. Um, well, it may not be difficult to say, oh, that's a fern. It's, it's much trickier to say, what fern is it? Um, and uh, there are guidebooks and whatnot that you can uh, get to help learn that. But these are, are some uh, more commonly or easily identified ferns. Christmas fern here is, is nearly evergreen. It looks a little tattered come uh, February, but it'll put out green foliage again. Uh, it has a fairly simple frond, and each of these, these uh, leaflets off the frond are called pinnae. Uh, what's unique about a Christmas fern, and virtually you can't really see it here, is at the base, each one there's a little lobe that comes up, and it could look like a boot. Santa Claus boot, uh, and that's one possible reason for the name Christmas fern. Also, it's, it tends to be green around Christmas time, so two two reasons for the for the name. Uh, sensitive fern can stand out; it's bright green in color. Uh, it has a, this feature of having leaf material right around the stem, whereas a lot of ferns. Are, are naked at the stem, and the, the ends of the uh, fronds are kind of fused together. Uh, it gets a name sent to the fern because as soon as the weather gets cold, uh, it dies off to the ground. So it doesn't last long. Um, ebony spleenwort uh, is a fairly small fern. Um, while the fronds may get up to a foot long, they're usually about four inches. It has kind of a roundish little uh, pinna, and the, the center stem is black. So it, the name ebony spleenwort. And this will grow in very dry locations. Sometimes you see it even uh, growing in lawns. Some uh, woodland and shade tolerant plants. Good uh, white avens is a an awful lot of this it grows around. It stays fairly close to the ground, a flat rosette of leaves. The leaves may be slightly lobed or they could be deeply cut in like these here. Um, it, uh, it stays pretty low until early summer when it puts up a stalk with some little white flowers on it. It's not a strikingly beautiful plant, but it is native and it grows. Uh, all over, so if you're looking for something to fill, uh, it's a plant worth encouraging. Uh, wild basils is a plant that often grows among tall grasses. You don't, you could easily miss it. Uh, I usually pick it out because these little pinkish flowers will, will stand out as, as as little bits of pink in, among the, the green grass. Uh, it's in the mint family, although it doesn't really have a, a minty scent to it. And uh, sedges. Uh, very similar to grasses, but they are a different uh, a different plant. Uh, they can be picked out because they have uh, triangular stems to them, whereas a grass would be, have a round stem or a flat stem to it. And if you look at it from above, you can kind of see the the leaves going off at uh, 120 degree angles. So it's as opposed to grasses, which tend to be uh, kind, of, it, kind of linear going off. Uh, some other woodland plants. Um, white snake root is very common along the, uh, you see along the roadsides in uh, late summer. Um, basically kind of dark green plant and with Striking white foli uh, white white flowers on top. Um, Virginia jump seed is another woodland plant. It's not particularly beautiful, but it is uh, it is from this area. Uh, it's kind of stands out. It's got a tall stalk here with small white flowers on it that uh, distinguishes it. Oops. Um, in the open lands, uh, wing stem is uh, very common, although it's more common on uh, richer sites. 
grows to six or more feet tall in the uh, late summer and is, uh, has the yellow flowers, which uh, bees like a lot. Um, sumacs, there's uh, several species of these that grow. This is a uh, staghorn sumac, it's probably one of the more commonly seen, and these stand out mostly in, in the fall when they have colors of re bright red, and yellow, and orange. Um, all through the summer, you'll see uh, sunflowers. Um, this particular one is, is actually uh, in a different genus, but it's uh, oxide sunflower, uh, and that blooms early in, uh, in June or early in the summer. Um, and it's here it's accompanied by, uh, by yarrow, which is a, a plant that's found around the world, but it's, it is native to, the, uh, to, to this area as well. So a lot of asters, especially in the fall. Uh, these are, are four different ones. Uh, they come in shades from purple to white. Uh, this calico aster is kind of interesting. It's a very common plant. But so distinguished about this is the uh, white flowers either have a yellow or a red center, depending on where they pollinate. So after pollination, the yellow center is go, go red. And it kind of gets this, I guess, calico appearance of white with all these different colored spots in there. Um, late summer. Goldenrods are very common. There are goldenrods that grow in the sun, like the chilly goldenrod, uh, plume like foliage. Uh, in the shade, there's probably, uh, I think maybe 10 species that grow well in the shade. This is the elm leaf goldenrod. Um, down here, the leaves are somewhat elm, shaped like an elm. It's the same. Um, Blue mist flower is a very common plant that you'll run into as well. There are many species you find in the lawn. Um, they're not all, not all just weeds. I called this one out. I didn't really get a good picture of it. These are pussy toes. And you see, maybe you can pick out the little white flowers here, and these will, will show up in the, in the spring. Um, I ran into these over at New Jerusalem Lutheran Church when I mow the lawn and I usually end up mowing them over before I stop to take a picture. So um, I had to get this picture from off the internet. Uh, they, when they're not in bloom, they have these leaves that are very close to the ground and they're covered with long hairs that uh, catch the sunlight. So it gives them a, a silvery appearance. Um, I mentioned self-heal early on. This, is a plant that shows up in the lawns occasionally. It moves around a lot. It's a big plant. Um, but it's got little purplish flowers. Violets. I'd say most of the violets that you would run into are native. Uh, I think the only non native violet that's uh, in the area is uh, has white and yellow and blue. Uh, just do the bi colored and tri colored uh, flowers. Um, Violets are, are edible, both uh, both the flowers and the leaves can be consumed raw. Uh, plantain, the plantain, uh, many of them are, are non-native. Uh, I think the Indians call them white man's eel uh, because they showed up wherever the white men were living. Uh, this particular one, I believe, is, is American plantain and doesn't really show up well here. There's a red streak down here on the base, and it's got that red color. It's more likely to be of a native uh, origin as opposed to one that's that's totally green there. Um, and flea banes. This one, uh, Philadelphia flea bane, uh, is a biennial. It, it blooms uh, kind of midsummer. This also uh, it blooms early summer. There's a annual flea bane that blooms later in the summer. It looks very similar to it. These little white and yellow flowers. Um, on the edges, uh, 
there's uh, clear weed is a member of the uh, metal family. It doesn't have any any spines to it. It's, it's an annual. It will crop up uh, one year and then disappear the next. Um, nimble will is a grass that can be kind of unruly if it's not mown. It, it forms kind of billowy masses of grass, but in the in the turf it, it lays pretty flat. Uh, I, I call these out because they're these are two species that grow in, well in shady areas that can be used to uh, combat Japanese uh, stilt grass, which uh, no problem. Uh, vines. Uh, we have five uh, five species of grapevines grow in Loudoun County. Um, Virginia creeper is, I guess, ever present. It does stand out in the fall as, as having a lot of color, especially along tree trunks. Um, it produces berries, uh, usually higher up in the trees. They don't often see them. Uh, so you don't see them growing on the ground. And birds really like these berries. One of the reasons we have uh, Virginia creeper everywhere. <laughs> they get spread by a lot. Uh, poison ivy uh, also has berries. These will eventually turn white. Uh, and usually they're found much higher up in the tree. This particular one was right at eye level and almost locked into it. Um, again, native plant, poison ivy. Um, Virgin's Valor is a native clematis. It tends to grow sort of over the top of plants, small white flowers and blooms, uh, kind of early summer as opposed to autumn clematis, which is a, a, a non native, somewhat invasive. Uh, clematis that, that blooms uh, in, in, in autumn. Um, so those are our, just an uh, overview of some of the kind of random uh, native plants that you might run into. If you're interested in doing landscaping with that one, you really want to focus on beautiful plants. Uh, I would refer you to some of these uh, references. Uh, Plant Nova Natives is an excellent resource about this Booklet. I think it's about 60 pages of information on various plants and habitats and plant selection. Uh, PlantVirginiaNatives.org is another one. The, the DCR has a lot of uh, guides and online tools for doing plant selection. Uh, there's a book from the Chesapeake Bay uh, Planning for Conservation for, for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And it's, it's not automated yet. But, Kind of read the book, but it has a lot of good information on native plants and what's appropriate to uh, different habitats. Um, so, talk about some of the threats to native plants. Uh, habitat destruction destruction is a really big problem, uh, particularly for wetland plants. And Loudon doesn't have a lot of wetlands, but uh, in general, wetlands get drain to do uh, new construction that's sort of prime uh, real estate. And, and that <clears throat> once drained, that, that habitat's lost. We're also seeing with uh, sea level rise, salt water infiltration coming back into wetlands. So that, that's another problem as well. Uh, fragmentation of communities is, uh, is an issue where it's, you know, or at some point you've got a large forest, if you have a lot of diversity, plants, animals moving around, when you start breaking those uh, areas up into smaller pieces, you lose the ability of plants and animals to interbreed, and that uh, results in a lower level of uh, diversity. And uh, well, deer are a big problem with, I mentioned earlier that native animals tend to eat native plants. So, uh, deer is going to go after the native species in the woodlands before it eats an invasive plant. So that, again, skews the, the population. Um, uh, again, I mentioned invasive species earlier. Um, this is of stilt grass growing in, in a woodland area. Basically, it, it crowds out the entire ground plains with very little light in for uh, other plants. 
to uh, to survive. Um, so that's a threat. Uh, climate change also is a threat as temperatures change. Plants that are used to colder weather have a problem. Yes. Right. Yeah. Fire kind of works as long as you put something else in afterwards. I've, I've, I've messed around with trying to burn the spell grass and, and I didn't put something back in and it came right back up. Yeah, that's right. Are there any questions that I Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, I I haven't seen. Well, clearly it's an annual, so you need to get seed. I haven't seen that available. Uh, a lot of people have talked about where to get seed for nimble will, um, so that may be available. And you know, I I left my nimble will. I mowed around it <laughs> this year, so so it could uh, kind of seed and spread a little bit more. Um, and it is a pretty common. Common grass. If you just don't mow it, you'll you'll get some seed from that. Um, okay. Climate change. Oh yeah. So uh, again, as temperatures change, you need basically to have a way for plants to move to colder environments. So that's where fragmentation comes in as a problem. If the plant can't jump to that next colder environment, it can it can be stuck. And rainfall changes are a huge problem. Is Again, the plants are used to moist conditions. Um, as it dries out, they don't have a choice. They can't get up and run to the next moist area. Um, this is a list of invasive species. Uh, the uh, Department of Forestry has a list of probably close to 100 of high priority of, of uh, invasive species. Um, 60 of them are considered high or, or medium. Um, risk of, of, of invasion and, and damage. Uh, these are just a few. I put the dates when they showed up in the uh, in North America. Most of these were brought in for some commercial or horticultural or, or decorative reason. Uh, just Japanese snow grass and myelin in it are two that really showed up by accident. Snow grass um, it's estimated to come out around 1919 as with packing material, porcelain packing material, packing material for porcelain mm -hmm. coming in from, from China. Uh, so there's some seeds in there in that straw. Uh, Milo Minute uh, was a contaminant in some seed that was brought into uh, Pennsylvania in the 1930s. And it's Certainly a problem. Uh, some good news on myelominate. There is a weevil that will eat the leaves. It's not going to make myelominate go away, but it does help temper its, its growth. So that's uh, uh, bringing in another species to, to uh, battle an invasive. That's a case where it's working. Um, yeah. On invasive, specific invasives, but that's we're getting a little bit long. I just wanted to point out English ivy. Um, here is climbing up a tree. Uh, like many climbing vines, they don't really bloom and set seed until they get high up in the canopy. So one way to deal with, with a vine like this is to cut it off at the bottom and just, just leave it. I mean, you spend 10 minutes and and clear the tree and just, just leave it. And you will, as a result, cut down on the, the transmission and generation of new seeds. Uh, English ivy in particular, it's evergreen foliage, can damage trees, get to the weather and, and can bring down branches. I also host a bacterial leaf scor scorch. Um, a new invasive I just wanted to call out uh, is wavy leaf basket grass. This has just shown up uh, since 1990 in the Patapsco Valley. Uh, currently, its distribution is between Philadelphia and Charlottesville. Uh, if you see it, 
growing in, in shady woods. I usually see it when I'm pulling up still grass. Um, but pull it out of the ground. If it's not going to seed, you can just let it dry out. If it's got seed on it, you should put it in a bag. Um, there is a phone number to call the uh, um, the Department of uh, Conservation and Recreation to report it if you, if you find that. Because our plan on your property is being tracked so that uh, um, efforts can be put forward to eradicate it. So some, some resources. For uh, learning more about native plants, if you're interested, the Virginia Native Plant Society has a great website. They're very active on Facebook. Uh, a lot's going on there. Uh, it's easy to get that information. Uh, one source of information I use for this talk is the Florida of Virginia. It's a book that was put out, I think it was published in 2012. It's huge. But for $20, you can get an app on your phone that basically has everything electronically. You can search it immediately. It's got keys in it, so you can try and identify plants by putting in, you know, it's got opposite leaves and it's just all of them. Has a flower that looks like such and such. So that's a very useful um, resource. Uh, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia do a lot with native plants as well. Uh, if you're interested in invasives in, in particular, the Blue Ridge Prism, um, it's a um, partnership for regional invasive species management. They've uh, recently expanded their activities in the Farquhar and and the Loudoun counties. So they do a lot of uh, watches for invasive plants. They do training to tell people how to deal with invasives. Uh, and they have a lot of information online. Uh, and the Penn State Extension Services, I've used that a lot for right, how to get rid of invasive species. That they have detailed instructions on what pesticides work and which don't. Uh, and, and other strategies for dealing with invasives. Um, some other groups, the uh, Virginia Mat Nas Master Naturalists um, basically deal with native plants and animals, the whole ball of wax there. It's uh, interested in how everything works together. Um, the Wild Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy is, is another group um, with that those uh, concerns. Uh, if you like to buy native plants, uh, some nurseries that are nearby, Watermark Woods in Hamilton Station has a lot of uh, natives, usually in small sizes, uh, and a very good selection there. A little further out, Hill House Native Plants in Castleton, uh, again, also has a lot of native plants. And one place that I, I order stuff from is uh, Wood Thrush Natives. Uh, they're done in Floyd, which is about four hours away. Uh, so I usually deal with them by, uh, by mail order. Um, and they, they ship uh, basically uh, early spring is a, is a good time and, and fall. They don't like to ship when it's, when it's hot out. Uh, but they have plants that are basically, they could tell you where that seed came from that they grew their plants. They're very, uh, very hardcore native plants. Uh, if you are interested in uh, identifying plants, a lot, a lot of online photo apps for your cell phone uh, are pretty effective. Uh, these are a few of them. Seek, uh, Leaf Snap, Picture This, Plant Net. They just basically take a picture of the plant and it'll give you an idea of what it is. Uh, it's not guaranteed, it's not 100% accurate, but it gives you a a leg up of, oh, I think it might be such and such, and you can do a little bit more research to, to figure things out. Um, again, I mentioned with uh, the floor of Virginia, there are digital keys where basically you plug in to your phone basically basic attributes of a plant, and it will give you a list of things that it could be. And uh, those are a lot easier than doing the old manual keys where you can uh, spend hours. Uh, if you're into paper, these are some uh, books that I, I use a lot for identifying plants. So Fern Finder is actually a pretty simple little booklet and it's got, uh, I've got 150 different ferns in there. Uh, Newcomb's 
wildflower guide that covers down to Virginia. It's mostly the Northeast, but, but Virginia is, is the extent of its, uh, of its range. Uh, if you like grasses, field guides for grasses in the Mid-Atlantic is, is you know, pretty easy to use. It's got uh, nice sketches in there. Uh, and if you want to see things in person, um, Appalachian Trail is a good place. Again, you're going to be high altitude, so you'll see more of the, the Blue Ridge um, area. A new state park now just off of uh, Harpers Ferry Road in Nearsville. It's a Sweet Run State Park, and there it's got a good variety of, of uh, habitats. This actually is a picture of, from, uh, from the Sweet Run. The parking lot area. So oh, they've got shrub areas and it goes up into the uh, oak forest there as well. And closer to Leesburg is Balls Bluff Regional Park in Leesburg in the Potomac. Just that's just east of Leesburg. And again, that's fairly rich soil there. You'll see a lot of uh, these rich uh, base looking plants. Um, I think that's actually, that's it. <laughs>